Good morning. Uh, we have a few minutes. First of all, I'd like to welcome you all to worship this morning. It's a beautiful day. And I'd like to welcome those on Zoom and those who might see us on uh, Facebook or uh, YouTube later. There are a few announcements. Uh, Mary Lou Cartledge is progressing slowly at Elderwood and Hornell. And Jerry says that maybe she might be with us next week. Uh, and it's Jerry and Mary Lou Cartledge's 63rd anniversary tomorrow. Uh, we'd also like to welcome Wendy Fambro back to the pulpit. Uh, I think you you know her her credentials, and so I'm not going to go into those now again. We do need somebody to bring flowers next week. Laurel Buckwalter was scheduled, but they're in Oregon. So if anybody is willing to bring flowers next week, um, the announcements say to let Dave Porter know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm not going to, I'm going to be out of town. Uh, let's see. Updates to the directory. Uh, the directory has been updated and Larry Casey has put it on the website. Uh, the deadline, if there are any updates or changes, take a look at it. Uh, the deadline for any changes is August 10th. Uh, I just want to remind you to fill out your feedback forms, if you would. And I'll let you know that next week, our guest preacher is Alex Wright. And now if you'll join me in the call to worship. When I think of God's presence in the world, I am grateful. And when I think of God's presence in my life, I am humbled. And when I think of God's presence in this community, I am glad. Let us be surrounded by holy people, worshiping our own God.
questions on Zoom? No. No. Well, first I'll just say good morning. Good morning. And it's nice to be back. Every time I'm here, I think about um, that I actually preached what's called a neutral pulpit here while the search committee from Ithaca came to listen in. And what I remember is Lori getting up and saying, well, we are Wendy's neutral pulpit, but we are not at all neutral. We are totally biased and we should completely hire her. <laughs> <laughs> and they did. So I always am grateful to be back here. I invite us to join together in prayer. God, we gather our spirits here in the presence of your Holy Spirit, and we lift our hearts to you. Though no prayers were spoken out loud, we know that each of us carries holy concerns in our hearts as we enter into the sanctuary. We know that you have already received them that your spirit has gone before us working to clear away. And so in this space, we simply offer the words of your people everywhere and throughout all time, asking that you watch over the poor, the lonely, those who are displaced from their homes, those who are victims of violence. We pray, God, that somehow, in some way, this world begins to catch a vision of your peace, that we are inspired to work in that direction, that we feel the joy that comes from serving one another, and that we embrace all who pass our way. We ask now, God, that you hear those prayers which have been held in this silent space for you. strength that you have given to us as disciples to live together the words that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Wonderful for me. It is so high, I 
Where can I go from your spirit? If I ascend to heaven, if I make my bed in jail, if I take the wings of the morning, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, Surely the darkness shall follow me, and the night shall suffer me. Even the darkness is not dark to you, the night is as bright as the day. For the darkness is as bright as the day. God of grace, we hear your call to generous giving in the way you meet our needs each day and in the peace you give which passes understanding. Having received so much, let us take this time to consider the ways in which we can use our time, talents, and money to benefit those in need.
and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. One, we weren't very good at softball. And two, 
Because the invitation had spread by word of mouth, we all came from human services fields. So my friend was one of several nurses and midwives. I was the clergy representative. Then we had a number of teachers, social workers, and yes, therapists. We could not bat for beans, but we were exceptional at encouragement and affirmation. So we quickly decided to move ahead with our plan and officially became the founding mothers of the Lost Dogs softball team. Just to prove it. Yes, here we go. Mitt. Well worn. And here we go. I'm not kidding. So the name was given to us by our sponsors, the Lost Dog Cafe, but it would certainly prove prophetic as well. So after a month of diligent practicing on the neighborhood field, we were feeling a bit more confident. Until, that is, we showed up at our first official game. The games were held at Union Fields in Ithaca, and the minute we went out onto the field to warm up, we discovered why we had been feeling so confident at Stewart Park. We had been playing, as it turns out, on a kid's field. <coughs> so it was about half the size of this regulation field that we now stood on, and it took the first few innings for our pitcher to get the ball more than two-thirds of the way to the plate. <laughs> the team that we faced was one of seven other teams that we would come to know well throughout that first season. They were all actually kind of alike. They were all tough, muscular, hard-hitting women. A cartoon version of them would have shown them with tattoos and cigarettes hanging out of their mouths. It would not have been far off. These were tough women. But they were mostly alike in that they all hated us. They hated the Lost Dogs team. They resented the days that they had to waste playing against our team because for them it was not only pointless, it was irritating. The problem was that the Lost Dogs team, we were relentlessly cheerful. We would laugh, we would affirm our way through seven innings of pure failure. The games were called at seven innings as the other team had more than a 10-run lead, and the other team always had more than a 10-run lead. So each game that season was an agonizing defeat. It was our defeat, but it was really the other team that found it agonizing. We still had a good time. Not only did they have to endure our continuing shouts of encouragement to each other throughout the game, but then they had to pass through that end of the game ritual, you know, where the two teams greet each other, good game, good game, good game, good game, good game, good game, clearly a lie. It had not been a good game. But then they would have to watch us celebrate with our fans. I haven't had the pleasure of spending an evening outside playing a game. Seemed like fun. The managers of the league would get together on a regular basis to work out league issues over the course of the season. That season, the other managers worked very hard to figure out how to get rid of us. We were actively disliked. They thought we made the league look bad. But we just kept showing up. And eventually, they just had to accept the reality that we were not going anywhere. And so they continued to rotate through our schedule, bored, testy, impatient, grim. But we were human service workers. We were used to getting no respect. Truly, we were not playing to make a point. We were playing for the sheer love of the game. And every now and then, one of the opposing team players would get caught up in our excitement for just a minute, long enough to smile and say, good hit, before sinking back into resentment. Okay, that was the first season. The second season, we found a coach. It was a little controversial because our coach was a guy, but he was a social worker and therapist, so he fit in. 
Not only was he supportive and gentle and kind, but he actually knew how to play ball. So the first, for the first time, our practices kind of had this sense of intentionality about them. He introduced us to the wonders of the infield fly rule, which had been a deep mystery to us through our entire first season. How many of you know what the infield fly rule means? You have all made very good lost dogs. Well, when we struck out, he would say, good effort, would you like some feedback, in a lovely therapeutic way. Together during that season, we kept alive, though, the central identity of our team, which was loving community. That's who we were. We also did increase our enjoyment by increasing our capacity to play. I actually spent time in my off hours at the local batting cage, finally discovered the rhythm and feel of a good swing, so that was cool. Nonetheless, the Lost Dogs continue to be the odd team, not just on the field, but on the sidelines as well. After each game, we would kind of go into this like Andy and Mayberry mode. We'd play with each other's children, we'd share Kool-Aid and homemade cookies. So from time to time, our right fielder's beeper would go off and she'd have to leave to go deliver a baby somewhere. It was kind of awesome. While the other teams would routinely lose interest in the actual game after the first inning or two, we stayed just consistently, relentlessly engaged in each play, each possibility. So I was the center fielder, a position I really like because there's actually only two choices as a center fielder. You either catch the ball, cool, or you don't catch the ball. In which case, you run like crazy to get it and leave it back into the infield. So, I did a lot of running. Of course, whenever one of us actually did catch the ball, the whole game would come to a screeching halt while we all did a little celebration dance on the field. I got better during that second season. We all got better, but we were still absolutely at the bottom of the league. So this story is about the Lost Dogs. It's about our determined insistence to bring joy to each game. But the larger story, the gospel story, is about what was happening around us. By our third season, the lost dogs had a waiting list to get onto the team. The local paper, which had routinely ignored the women's softball league, had run a feature article on us. A few people, from the winning teams had defected to our team, to the Lost Dogs, in order to return to a more um, innocent love of the game. And of course, when some of the newer folks from those competitive crews started to become a little too competitive, we would hold an intervention on the pitcher's mound <laughs> to remind them who we are. It was the fourth season when we won our first game. As with every night, there were a number of games being played simultaneously, but somehow word got around that a miracle was happening on field seven. And when the lost dog player crossed home plate to score the winning run, our own cheers were echoed by this large crowd which had gathered. Suddenly, everybody was on our team. We were all lost dogs, and everyone felt they had won with us. So the whole league celebrated our victory. At our year-end family picnic, our manager told us that the other managers had met with her to say that somehow our team had managed to change the very nature of the whole league. Barriers had broken down. The competition had become more fun and the public was more supportive of them as a whole than they had been in years, and they looked forward to seeing us back on the field the next spring. Last I heard, the Lost Dogs had so many people wanting to join that two additional new teams had been formed and welcomed into the league. So our team had formed to play softball. We were much more enthusiastic and skilled we barely knew the rules of the game. In fact, there were no rules. 
just like those first churches. We only had one policy, and that was a policy of joy. We were to gather in joy, we played with joy, we shared the joy, and we went back home with joy. We supported and encouraged each other, we gave it our all, whether we were swinging the bat or dancing in the outfield, we cheered for each other, we cheered for the other teams, we acknowledged a great hit or a well-timed double play, we embraced joy, and we became joy. As Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world. And Jesus said, I speak these things in the world so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word. The world has hated them because they don't belong in the world. Sanctify them in your truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through them, so that the world may know that you love them as you have loved me. Amen.
joy. We are together in joy. May we leave this place spreading joy. In Jesus' name, amen.